Uh, item 3.1 is a report of the city manager. There is a presentation today. Is that right, Dave? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, we, we have quite a bit to cover today, so appreciate this opportunity. Um, as always, we're going to start off with uh, unsung heroes, and today, uh, Deputy City Manager Kim Wallace is going to do the honors. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kim Wallace, Deputy City Manager, and it is my great pleasure today to recognize the census team as our unsung heroes. The census has been a long, very important journey over the last three years. This journey started in September of 2017 and just ended last month. The census means so much in terms of political representation and in terms of making sure San Jose gets our fair share of the over $1 trillion of federal and state programs that are tied to census results. Our city's most important goal was to ensure that we counted our neighborhoods that are the hardest to count and that had been undercounted historically so that every resident of our city knows that they matter to us and to our city's future. As a re direct result of our team's three-year effort, San Jose had a 77.2% self-response rate. To put this in context, this is the highest of the 85 cities in America with a population of over 290,000 people or more. And as you can see on the slide, we are by far the top performer among our large peer cities. For these results, if you can go to the next slide, there are many city staff I wanna to thank today as unsung heroes. First of all, none of this would have happened without the core leadership team of Jeff Ruster, Vilcia Rodriguez, and Nguyen Pham, who have been solidly leading this effort since day one. The first stage, which they, which they kicked off in September of 2017 and went to January of 2018, was centered on the local update of the census area, which we affectionately call the LUCA. This phase was critical because it resulted in more than 36,000 low visibility housing units being added to the Census Bureau's master address file. Key LUCA contributors included Matt Loesch and Harsh Gatam from Public Works, Sabrina Para Garcia from the Office of Immigrant Affairs, Sulma Maciel, now from the Office of Racial Equity, and Nick Almeida and Candace Lay from the Mayor's Office. Next slide, please. The second stage started in spring of 2019, and this was the design and implementation of the census outreach strategy with a special focus on historically hard to count populations. The core of this effort focused on partnerships with all city council offices, most city departments, the County of Santa Clara, and more than 80 community-based organizations. Key contributors during this second phase included Trevor Gould, Michelle Ornott, Jeremy Schaffner, Carolina Camarena, Carrie Adams Hapner, Emily Sevier, Michael Ogilvy, and Lawrence Thu. Next slide, please. Then in the third and last stage, there was, of course, the canvassing, the knock and talk effort, which ran intensely from August 28th to October 16th. And you've already heard of the amazing results. Most notably, the 6.8% increase in the self-response rate in these canvassed, traditionally hard to count neighborhoods. There were over 50 staff involved with this effort, most from PRNS Youth Intervention and Project HOPE teams. I do wanna call a few staff out by name for their leadership and support. Eric Rodriguez, Pablo Hockey, Andrew Eric, Andrea Flores Shelton, Mario Maciel, Hilda Morales, Joseph Gregory, Alvin DeLong, Veronica Schulte, David DeLong, Ray Gesemi, Kelly Parmley, Sarah Steele, Jackie Morales Ferrand, Reagan Henninger, and uh, Vanessa Beretta, the whole housing team, also helped with the homeless outreach during the stage, which was critical. I want to recognize and appreciate the council members and their staff 
and all the council staff and volunteers who are engaged with these canvassing efforts. But a special mention to, to D5, Council Member Carrasco and her staff, Francis Herbert, Herbert, Chiara Ariola and Omar Torres, uh, Council Member Esparza from D7 with Nick Casper, Mike Medina, Nat Palomino, Christian Cornejo and Michael Pierce and Adriana Ramirez, and from D8, Council Member Arenas and Victoria Lamb and her staff and volunteers. I would be remiss if I did not mention the partnership with the county, numerous CBOs, faith-based and other agencies that also supported this knock and talk great effort. Finally, there were many others who contributed significantly behind the scenes, providing support over the last three years. I'd especially like to mention Rob Lloyd, Nora Freeman, Arlene Silva, Benna Chang, Alexandria Felton, Dottie Barney, and Jennifer Garcia. Last slide, please. Just so you can see once again the results. As I'm sure is clear by now, this was a massive strategic and logistical undertaking conducted in an incredibly challenging national environment. Through all of the challenges and uncertainty, San Jose as a community absolutely distinguished itself. So on behalf of the administration, I express deep gratitude to the staff, to the council, and to our community partners for their hard work and outstanding success. You are our heroes. Great, thank you, Kim, and, and just thanks to all the census team for their phenomenal work. Um, this was really impressive and made us all, I think, very proud. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's what we're gonna cover today. Um, we've got a, a, our, our standard EOC update and certainly a lot to talk about with uh, our move back to yes. the purple tier. Um, we also have an update on crime during COVID, a communications update, uh, an EOC budget rebalancing update will be coming back to the council December 8th with, with action on that. And then um, I'm gonna close out uh, today's presentation with Kip's help on a, a, a next segment of the citywide roadmap uh, preview. Um, so at this point, I think I'm passing it off to uh, Lee Wilcox to do the EOC update. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council, uh, members of the public. I'm Lee Wilcox, Chief of Staff for the City Manager's Office and Co-Director of our Emergency Operations Center on, and on behalf of Kip Harkness, our other director of the EOC um, and all of the employees in the EOC, we're pleased to present uh, this update for you today. Next slide. Just on a quick note, uh, last time we heard very positive feedback on holding the moment and the collection of art by San Jose artists now being displayed by our airport. During this presentation and future city managers uh, reports, we will be interspersing some of that artwork throughout the presentation to continue highlighting these artists and the art that is helping us process through this unprecedented time. Next slide. Thank you. Um, as a result of the rising cases within our county, the state announced yesterday that the uh, county of Santa Clara would be uh, moving backwards from tier three or the orange tier back to tier one, uh, the purple tier. Accordingly, the city will be moving from stage eight of the city response stage back to stage six to align with the state and the county as part of this. In the next several slides, we'll walk through uh, why this happens and what it means for our community and some of our city services that we understand thus far. Next slide. The state is taking these significant steps to slow the spread of COVID-19 because we are currently seeing the fastest increases in cases in California in the history of this pandemic. Cases have jumped more than 50% in the last week, which exceeds the case growth, the case growth that we saw when cases were rapidly rising back in June as this slide demonstrates. Next slide. Within our own county, we can see a very similar pattern. Cases have increased as a very similar percentage over the past few weeks. At present, our average over the last week, um, or last two weeks, is daily cases of over 230, 
with daily numbers exceeding 300 and even as of yesterday exceeding 400. At the same time, our hospital beds and the rates have increased over the last several weeks, which we'll highlight in future uh, in, in slides to come. Important to know for this, um, for this slide is the context and the history of the pandemic. Um, if you look to the left, when we saw COVID-19 and when we began the shelter in place within our own county, uh, very low rates. This is really attributed to the lack of testing at this time. That, that first wave was actually uh, higher than is perceived. And so where we find ourselves right now is really in the third wave of the pandemic affecting um, our local community. And this data and these trends really match what we're seeing through the state and what we're seeing in various parts of the nation right now. Next slide. As a result of this, California uh, is moving uh, counties back to more restrictive tiers, including many counties back to tiers, uh, such as our own county uh, today. 28 counties have moved into the purple tier compared to last week. In pulling the emergency break, the state has changed the operation of the tier system in the following ways compared to how it operated before. Currently, uh, uh, counties can move uh, back two tiers at once. So before a county could only move back one tier, now they can move two tiers if the data supports that. Second, the state can adjudicate tiers using only the most recent week's worth of data. Previously, the state was using the two weeks uh, worth of data to make these decisions, but in an effort to be more nimble and uh, take actions based off of the latest trends, they've made that change of using one week's worth of data. In addition, the state is also using new data uh, and measurements to adjudicate the tiers, including the rate of increases in cases and hospital statistics. For our own county in particular, there are two pieces of data the state looked at very carefully. And the first was the rise in cases. The seven day average in our own county went up by 66% between November 1st and November 8th. In addition, the rise in hospitalizations increased rapidly with patients hospitalized for COVID-19 by uh, roughly 40%. The county's own public health officer, Dr. Sarah Cody, was very clear about what she feels this means, saying yesterday, today's announcement from the state reflects what we appear to be heading, that we appear to be heading into the worst phase of this pandemic to date. Next slide. So the move back to uh, the purple tier will reduce restrictions, which are meant to slow and spread COVID-19 in our own community. As we have with all changes in public health restrictions, we will continue communicating aggressively with our own community and with our businesses regarding these changes. The table in front of you does summarize some of the changes that our residents and businesses will need to adhere to. Understanding some of these restrictions are complex because it does involve combining both state restrictions as well as additional county restrictions. So we will be available to answer questions at the end of this presentation, but we also anticipate uh, receiving further information and further guidance from the county and the state in coming days. As we look, there will likely be no changes, at least at this point in time for the schools that are already open, as well as nail care and hair salons or barbershops. Um, but we've also, um, there will be additional restrictions um, and capacity for places that are allowed to continue to operate indoors with some shopping malls or grocery stores uh, moving down to a 50% occupancy. And then there's a host of activities that had uh, been opened up indoors in recent weeks and months. Um, and those have now been closed with additional modifications for their own outdoor uh, usage. And then there's a number of um, closures um, for indoors and outdoors uh, related to bars and breweries that are not serving uh, full service meals, as well as live audience events, and that schools um, that have not yet uh, reopened do not have the ability to open within the county while we're in tier one. Next slide. We do anticipate the effect um, of this change on city services will be minimal at this point. Uh, we have, to this point, taken a very conservative and deliberate approach to reopening, um, keeping this potential scenario in mind. Um, out of an abundance of caution, we are enacting some changes until additional guidance and modifications 
are released from the state of California and the county. And that is stopping city-related gatherings, including community meetings, closing some of the indoor gyms at fis, uh, city facilities in accordance with the state guidance, and uh, currently pausing indoor code enforcement and environmental inspections, except for emergency situations, but continuing all exterior and remote inspections. As we continue to evaluate opening city services, we will continue uh, to take a conservative and deliberate approach while we're in tier one, um, especially with the current spread and, and rising of COVID-19 in our community. Again, we do expect additional clarifications and changes in the coming days and weeks, and the EOC will continue to monitor, evaluate, and refine our approach over time and update the council. Next slide. Switching gears to more optimistic news, uh, we want to touch briefly on the vaccine news we received from Pfizer last week and then from uh, Moderna uh, yesterday. Both companies released uh, preliminary results of the trial showcasing their vaccines with uh, results greater than 90%. Both trials have ensured that they have representation from a diverse uh, diversity of racial and ethnic backgrounds. In each trial, approximately 40% of participants are from non-white racial and ethnic group, which is exceedingly important given the global impact and threat of COVID-19 on such a diverse earth. Um, so this is good news. 90% effectiveness is better than uh, that we expected, that a lot of uh, medical experts expected. So this definitely means there is light at the end of a tunnel. However, we are still in a very long tunnel and have a long way to go. Uh, and this is for many reasons. Um, most importantly, these trials are not over. They're still continuing. Second, and probably most importantly, the logistics of producing, storing, and distributing a vaccine are very complicated. We do expect to hear a lot more from the state of California and the county in the coming weeks as they take the lead on figuring this out. The county has already reported to their board preliminarily on an approach, and we as the city are seeking to better understand their logistical and their communications plan and are offering to support in any way we can. For the current moment, it is still crucial, it is still crucially important that we continue to wear masks, socially distance, and take precautions. It is important to protect our community now uh, with our behaviors and with our choices. Only then will it be um, increasingly likely that a vaccine could produce widespread help towards the middle of next year. So light is at the end of the tunnel, um, but consistent with the, what we've seen thus far in 2020, um, we still have a long way to go. That tunnel is uphill and there's a variety of, of hurdles that will be thrown at us as we continue this work. Next slide. And I'll wrap up with a brief update um, from the last time we reported out on EOC activities over the past months and we last reported, these are the following highlights that we'd like to review with you. Uh, we worked with our partners to coordinate and distribute close to 9 million meals in the city of San Jose with no major gaps reported. After fully opening the first of three temporary housing sites last month, we continue to work on Evans Lane and Rue Ferrari, and we are tracking to open these next month. We've completed preliminary emergency operations center, the emergency funding uh, rebalancing and the coronavirus relief rebalancing um, and budget exercise, which you'll hear later today. And then we'll be taking final actions December 8th, as Dave mentioned. We completed physical and safety improvements to allow the reopening of Happy Hollow Zoo, which occurred last week, November 10th, we currently have 15 learning pods open um, at city facilities. And we've finalized a number of advertisements and communications materials that are going live in four languages on radio, TV, newspaper, and social media around the city. You'll be hearing more about this work and our approach from our EPIO team uh, during this report. Uh, last two, after receiving 119 applications from our nonprofit partners, totaling over $9 million in grant requests, the Community and Economic Recovery Branch will award $3.3 million to 51 nonprofits who are providing CARES Act qualified services in our COVID-19 impacted zip codes and to, community, and to communities most impacted by COVID. 
Through the Silicon Valley a Strong Partnership, the Knight Foundation is also expanding the impact of the local assistant nonprofit grant program with financial support to an additional 14 nonprofits. This grant program uh, is in addition to the financial support already in the community for small businesses and arts and culture nonprofits. Thank you to the Knight Foundation. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Lieutenant Donahue from the police department who will provide an update on crime statistics during the COVID-19. Thank you, Lee, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome, all right. Well, good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and members of the public. My name is Lieutenant Steve Donahue. I'm the commander of the Research and Development Unit at the San Jose Police Department. And today I'm gonna to be presenting an update on crime occurring during the COVID-19 shelter in place. I'll be reporting on the time period between March and October, and any incidents occurring after October will not be included in this report. Slide, please. The map you see here is our year to date. So uh, this is including both the shelter in place and the homicides occurring this year before the shelter in place. There were six before the shelter in place. During the shelter in place this year from March to October, we had 31 homicides. During the same period last year, March to October, we had 24. In all of 2020 so far, we've had 37. And in all of 2019, we had 31. Slide please. Robbery is down, uh, what, what you're looking at here is our uniform crime reporting statistics that we send uh, to the federal government. Uh, so robbery is down 15% compared to the same period last year and aggravated assaults are down 2% compared to the same period last year. Burglaries are down 1% compared to the same period. However, when we dissect the burglaries, we find some interesting anomalies. First of all, residential burglaries are down 27%. The commercial burglaries are up 24% and school burglaries were up 135%. There was a tremendous spike in school burglaries at the beginning of COVID. In the first 12 weeks, we had 45 burglaries citywide. And in that same period last year, we only had nine. So it was a huge jump because kids weren't in school. So recognizing this, the department uh, assigned our TABS, which is our truancy abatement and burglary suppression units and the school liaison unit to conduct school patrol checks. Over 5,700 school patrol checks were conducted by patrol tabs and school liaison since the start of COVID. And that has definitely lowered the number of school burglaries. In addition, we proactively reached out to the school districts and asked them to move anything of value from the sites. So we now are seeing um, everything leveling off to maybe one to two school burglaries a week. Larceny, our theft is down 21% compared to the same period last year. And auto theft is up 20% compared to the same period. And we believe this is because vehicles are being left unattended and not being driven during the shelter in place, particularly in high density housing areas. Rape incidents are down 20% compared to the same period last year. But as you can see, domestic rape is up 177%. So we looked into this, why do we have a big jump? And what we found is we've implemented a new thing called an intersectionality tool. And what this is, is anytime an officer responds to a domestic violence incident in the city of San Jose, they now ask questions about prior sexual assault incidents uh, occurring with the victim. And that form is crossing the lines between sexual assault and domestic violence. It went live in January, 2020, and we've trained all of patrol in the, in the use of this form. And what we've seen is an increase in cases based on the reporting from this form. Slide, please. So if you look at the domestic rape reporting cases that occurred in San Jose between March and October, you'll see that the majority, uh, I'm sorry, the one third of those cases occurred um, historically or earlier in the year. So earlier in the year, this year or years past. And so we looked at those that occurred during COVID. At the end of September, Sexual Assault Investigations Unit, Lieutenant Jaime Jimenez um, audited the rapes occurring during the shelter in place. And at the time there were 31 cases. And Lieutenant Jimenez discovered 19 of those reported rape cases were reported during domestic violence in investigations. So this means that the sexual assaults were not uncovered until after 
the intersectionality tool was used and the tool is working now to bring in cases that would otherwise go unreported. So if we take those 19 cases that came out from the intersectionality tool and we set them aside just for a moment and we compare the cases that we have Uh, Lieutenant Donahue, I think your speaker's just gone off. We had you until just a second ago. There we go. We got you now. Oh, now. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, we got you. Thanks. Let me turn this thing off. Uh, sorry. No worries. Let's try this. Mayor, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thanks. Uh, for some reason, none of my speakers are working now. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can hear you fine. You're able to hear us. Lieutenant Donahue, we, we can actually hear you fine. Yeah, my computer froze. Okay. We're All right. To, fine. Do do we want to maybe skip back, Lee, and then we'll come back with Ken Donahue? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. You able to hear us? Yeah, apologies. Sorry about that, Mr. Mayor. No worries. So All we right. can skip forward in the presentation yeah, we'll if you'd back. like, Mayor. Yeah, let's come back to Lieutenant Donahue as soon as the uh, hardware is. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're hearing you we fine. We can hear you. You're not hearing us. I think that's part of the problem. I'm, I can hear you just fine now. I'm good oh, to go. Okay. Oh. Go ahead. Then. Yeah, we're able to hear you. All right. Uh, where did I lose you, Lee? <laughs> 19 cases uh, and intersectionality. Yeah. That's where we left Thank off. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. All right. So if we take the 19 cases out of the 31 that um, we looked at that were reported during this period, uh, we have 12 cases. And last year, that's congruent with the 13 cases. So what we're finding is that the number of sexual assaults um, that are being reported are not necessarily higher, but what is uh, effective is this intersectionality tool is now giving us the opportunity to find out about cases that wouldn't normally be reported to us. So taking this all into account, we're cross-reporting to our community-based organizations, both the YWCA and Nextdoor Solutions, and we're working with them to provide resources and services to the victims. Next slide, please. We've had nine gang-related homicides reported in 2020, all during the shelter in place. In the last year, there were seven gang-related homicides between March and October in the comparable time period, and there was only nine all year. So gang-related ag aggravated assaults are down 23% compared to the same period of last year, and gang-related simple assaults are down by a third, and self-initiated activity is up by 26%. So while the homicides are up, overall gang incidents are down 10%. And we can attribute this to three approaches. The first being the increase in self-initiated activity, particularly with our violent crimes enforcement team and high visibility patrol and street level enforcement. Secondly, our gang investigations unit is coordinating throughout the Bureau of Investigations and the robbery unit homicide assaults to identify, locate and arrest violent subjects with overlapping criminal investigations. The gang investigation unit is also coordinating multi-jurisdictionally with outside agencies throughout the Bay Area, including Sunnyvale Department of Public Safety, CHP and the surrounding cities. Anecdotally, in one investigation in May, eight subjects were arrested for numerous gang-related violent crimes throughout our city, as well as weapons and narcotics violations. And since March of 2020, the Gang Investigations Unit has taken 38 firearms off the streets. Outstanding job. In addition to that, we work with the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force to work on contacting victims of gang violence and their families, providing resources, and removing gang graffiti and vigils that draw negative attention from rival gangs. And finally, there are weekly collaboration meetings as well as community meetings occurring in high gang impacted areas. Next slide, please. When we look at domestic violence, overall domestic violence related incident reporting has increased 2%. And this includes simple assaults and criminal threats. Aggravated domestic violence reporting is up 9% compared to the same period last year. And 
when we're looking at the domestic violence reporting for these aggravated or high, high violence crimes, we're seeing historical reports versus occurrence differentiation. The part one, part one crimes that are reported to the Uniform Crime Reports are um, only domestic rapes, domestic robberies, and domestic aggravated assaults. And if you look at those being the most serious crimes, they are up 9%. However, when you add the lower level domestic violence crimes, uh, these domestic violence, which such as minor injury, direct domestic violence, domestic battery, and criminal threats, they generally stay the same. So domestic violence occurrences are consistent compared to the same period last year. So we looked at why this is occurring. So on, on the domestic violence response form, when officers respond, and I mentioned earlier the intersectionality tool, they have to fill out a box asking about sexual assaults. Well, they also have to fill out information asking about prior incidents of domestic violence. If the victim reports that they had been subjected to domestic violence in the past, the next question is, was that reported? If the answer to that is no, officers are taking a new report. So it's not uncommon for them to respond to a domestic violence incident and then leave with two or three reports of prior domestic violence in addition to what was already reported for that day. What that does for our statistics is that two things happen. First off, we report to UCR based on when it's reported, not when it occurred. And our occurrences then are kept statistically based on when they occurred. So you'll see this jump in report to nine, jump by 9%. But what that is, is because they're reporting historical incidents and we're not seeing that in occurrences. <clears throat> we're coordinating our efforts through Nextdoor and the YWCA and conducting outreach and messaging to communities throughout the city. We've seen an increase in domestic robberies. And what that is, is it almost all of them is the suspect grabbing the victim's cell phone. And we're now categorizing, categorizing that as a robbery. And in years past, it was never captured as a robbery. It was always captured as just part of the domestic violence. But in this last year, we've actually created a drop down list to add this as a robbery, as a separate charge in and of itself. We trained all of patrol in it in November of last year and again in January of this year. And as a result, we're now finding that these domestic robberies are being documented in and of themselves with better categorization is giving us better stats. You'll see on the domestic violence statistics in front of you um, an anomaly in August spike up 42% from the prior month. As you can see, the prior month was down, uh, I believe it's 14%. And when you take the average over that July, August, September period, when you kind of uh, uh, put it across three months, it's actually only a 7% increase. We don't know why it spiked 42% in August. We do know that when you look at it as an aggregate over the year, it's actually only a 2% increase. Um, we also don't have any precipitating factors in August that would indicate to us why it would increase. And when you look at it over the three month span, just the month before and the month after, it's only a 7% increase. So what we've found is that there is no correlation to shelter in place and domestic violence determined upon review of the data and a sampling of the reports. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Lieutenant Donahue. So up next, I'm gonna hand it off to Colin, Chelsea, and Carolina. And we were in front of you several weeks ago um, on the overarching strategy for our strategic communications plan and how we pretend to proceed. And today we have an update on kind of the next several months as well as our own metrics and methodology for tracking this work. So I believe Colin, you're starting us off. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council and members of the public. My name is Colin Haney. I'm currently serving as the Emergency Public Information Officer in the EOC. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. Thanks. So today I'm going to discuss some of the communications updates that we have pushed out over the last several weeks. I'm not talking about our long-term strategic communications plan. Chelsea and Carolina are going to discuss that in a bit. These are announcements that were dependent on changing circumstances that the EPIO produced as needed. The first bucket on the left is announcements and changes in policy at the state and county level. This one is obviously timely. Uh, we had an announcement last Friday when we thought we were gonna go into red and then again yesterday when we moved into the purple category. 
And of course, we're continuing to monitor that closely and make sure that our residents and our businesses understand the latest change in restrictions. As you all know, the city does not issue health orders, but our residents and our businesses look to us to make sense of them. EPIO has been supporting the Office of Economic Development with translation, as well as some social media and content development services. Our goal is to take that complex technical language and concepts and frame them in terms that can be understood by most of the population. This also makes it easier for us to translate the updates into Spanish, Vietnamese, and traditional and simplified Chinese, which we do for just about everything that leaves our shop. As we've discussed here previously, we also push out testing, tracing, and supported isolation information using plain language through our weekly flash reports on the virtual local assistance center website and brochure and through social media. And lately we've been sharing information about the importance and availability of the flu vaccine. Uh, next are our secondary and tertiary emergencies, which unfortunately we've had a few of this year. In September, you heard about our efforts during the CZU and SCU complex fires from Jenny Loft of the Environmental Services Department. Since then, EPIO has responded to two PG&E public safety power shutoffs and multiple protests or potential protests. For the PSPS events, we worked closely with Amanda Orozco and Raul Hernandez in the Community Energy Department to write, translate, and schedule some social media posts and next door posts to explain the location and extent of the outages. For the protests, we've focused on providing proactive information to help keep people safe when they gather. We work closely with the police department's PIO to prepare a communication strategy every time we suspect there might be protest activity so we can quickly spread the word about any significant changes on the ground. And then finally, there are the many issues and announcements that fall into the other category. Having a dedicated EPIO with content development, language access, web, and social media units allows us to be quick, effective, and collaborative in our communications. We're able to write, design, translate, and distribute digital and physical collateral to respond and react to changing situations. Because we're working across all the branches of the EOC and several departments in the city, we're also able to effectively coordinate responses to media inquiries on topics that are multidisciplinary, like the Beautify San Jose Response Branch or the Alfresco Initiative. So that's a bit of our day to day. Now I'm pleased to introduce Chelsea Palacio, our creative manager in the EPIO. She's gonna talk about the design direction that we're taking to maximize the impact of our communications in the communities most vulnerable to COVID. Thank, thank you, Colin. Again, my name is Chelsea Palacio. I oversee the creative direction for the strategic communications plan and am the graphic designer for the housing department. Next slide, please. So the goal of the communication plan is to align with the EOC roadmap by using the data and the data from the Santa Clara County Health Department and the city annual report to focus on the hardest to reach communities along with the general population. From this data, we can prioritize those who are most vulnerable to COVID-19 and its effects by expanding our reach to bridge any communication barriers like technology or language. Next slide, please. So our creative goals include a strong, cohesive city brand for consistency and a strong informational hierarchy to make sure that information is clear and easy to read. To do this, we ask the following questions. What is the most important to the audience, or in this case, our residents? Does the messaging have any underlying messages that could be offensive? And is there a narrative or value represented? To bridge communication barriers, we focus on cultural relevance or aligning our messaging to be relevant to our residents' culture while remaining true to the city's brand. This aims to expand the city's brand to be more inclusive, more colors, more languages, and images that reflect our communities. Next slide, please. So in order to have a direction for designing with cultural relevance in mind, we research culture communication and marketing strategies. We did online research and formal focus groups with members of the EOC Language Access Unit, or LAU for short, as well as asking for input from other departments and had discussions with the county. With this information, we went forward with bilingual messaging, 
to decrease language barriers and expanded our reach to residents in our communities. We also work with the LAU for transcreation of our material. Transcreation is one of our key strategic initiatives as transcription of English word for word to another language doesn't always create the same meaningful messaging we want to express. Transcreation brings our, our materials closer to our more inclusive San Jose communication strategy. The next four slides include samples of our materials and key research we use to create that. Next slide, please. So for English or multilingual materials, we strictly follow the city brand with color, typefaces, and overall look and feel. In our bilingual materials, English becomes a secondary messaging to still reach residents who speak English as their first language, but not to stray away from the residents we are aiming to communicate with. Next slide, please. So for Spanish, we aim to add to have bilingual messaging as much as possible and highlighted the value of family in the images. Because we know um, from our research, family is a very important value in the Spanish culture. Next slide, please. So for our Vietnamese materials, research directed us to use the color yellow when it was appropriate. We made sure imagery related to status and respect while sticking to the city brand. We also made sure to use different images in Vietnamese and Chinese materials to make the artwork distinct for each language. Next slide, please. Lastly, for our Chinese, lastly, our Chinese research directed us towards using the color red when it was appropriate, um, centering the text instead of left aligning it like how we usually do for English and spacing out information the information a little bit differently. For Chinese, we also transcreated information in both traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese, as it is very important and politically correct to, and the most poli politically correct way to research, to reach and include all Chinese speakers in the community. Now I will direct you all to Carolina, who will expand on when and where these materials will live. Next slide. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Colin. I'm Carolina Camarena, and alongside Colin Haney, I am uh, co-leading as the Emergency Public Information Officer. So some of you may have already seen or heard some of this monolingual advertisement that is targeted at our hardest to reach communities and the audience that is specified in our EOC Strategic Communications Plan. We continue to work on advertisement and will soon include Univision, radio, TV, and digital. <coughs> Facebook ads, KTSF, Channel 26, Chinese TV, and more. But what we must know is that in addition to the advertisement, we have direct outreach, which really consists of teams of individuals visiting commercial areas and business districts within the zip codes identified in the strategic plan. We will make sure that all of you have access to these assets so you can help amplify the message to residents and businesses. And when we, start the direct, uh, when we start the direct outreach, we also welcome your involvement. Next slide, please. So to ensure that the ads are reaching the people we intend them to reach, we are keeping an eye on performance. This will help us pivot and update or edit the message if needed. In YouTube, just a few days ago, we placed ads in four languages and there are four messages per language. One, you've heard, get tested. Two, supported isolation services are available. Number three is our tried and true message of staying safe, which is wearing your mask, keeping your distance, staying home if you're ill, washing your hands. And lastly, we want to make sure that individuals understand that the virtual local assistance is here to assist and provides them with resources. So we're going to go ahead and show you a preview of the video. Uh, Andrew, can you please play the video now?
Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and just to be clear, that's a 15 second social media video that we've placed on YouTube and it's in Spanish and it was one of the four messages. The rest of the slide, you will see the perform performance of the YouTube ads, which have only again been running for a few days and yet they are doing very well. So our cost per view is two cents, which is lower than the industry average of 2.6 cents. Um, and our um, view rate, and the view rate is the number of people who continue to watch the video even after they've given the opportunity to skip the ad. I'm sure you've all seen those. But our view rate is 27.13%, which is higher than the industry average of 25%. Next slide, please. Now here, I just really want to thank my colleagues. We could not implement an outreach and communications without a team of professional city communicators. I want to thank my colleagues and their departments who have helped us in implementing the plan to ensure we are reaching our most vulnerable. Next slide, please. As Chelsea mentioned, we had a team of city staff who helped ensure the ads were transcreated and culturally relevant. These are individuals who are bilingual and bi bicultural. And some of us live in the neighborhoods affected by COVID-19 and English is our second language. Next slide, please. I also want to thank this team, the Language Access Unit, LAU for short, for creating language glossaries that will ensure we have unified and consistent words to use in Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese citywide. So to conclude this presentation, we will continue to amplify important information from the state and county, respond to all emergencies, and ensure that our communities have the information they need in their language, in their neighborhoods, to prevent and stop the spread of COVID-19. With that, I'll hand it over to Lee. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you to you and Colin for your leadership. Uh, next slide. Uh, I wanna do a special thank you to Chelsea. Uh, for your work and your team's work in the EOC. I think that was your first council presentation. So congratulations and well done. Um, next, we're gonna move into our EOC budget rebalancing strategy and, and start to preview some of the actions that we'll take on um, December 8th, um, as well as our funding strategy for the beginning of the year. Um, and joining me as part of this presentation will be Jim Shannon, our city's budget director, as well as Luz Cofrese Howe, who is the assistant director of our finance department, but also leads our finance section in the Emergency Operations Center. Next slide. Um, so today we are going to update you on the overall 315 or $317 million COVID response and recovery budget, as well as updates on various appropriation and start to preview um, some of the budgetary strategy, um, ensuring that the city has funding capacity in the new year to continue our own operations in the EOC supporting our at-risk populations in the city of San Jose. For the pa past several weeks, our finance and recovery section has continued to monitor all funding very closely um, and work uh, with the appropriate funding sources that we've tied to. In addition, we've started to engage our intergovernmental relations partners to uh, assess the likelihood and timing of additional funding, particular at the federal level. Um, and you'll hear more about that as part of 3.4 and 3.5 the IGR reports from our federal lobbyist, and continuing to prepare for the possibility that there is no additional funding through the end of June, um, and trying to stay as, as flexible um, as we can on some of the, the, shift, the shifting in the news. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Luz for the next slide. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and members of the public. Uh, Luz Kofresi Howe, Assistant Director of Finance, and the Emergency Operations Center Finance and Recovery Coordinator, along with Rick Bruno. Um, this slide summarizes the current overall state of the city's emergency relief funds. As you can see, the city has netted an additional 10.6 million in federal and state dollars since we last presented the council back in late September with information on funding that we've received specifically to address the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. To go briefly through the pluses and minuses, the FEMA funds were reduced to reflect the amount that we believe we will recover from that particular funding source at this time. 
This is not to say we won't pursue additional monies from FEMA in the coming months, but rather to pare this funding source down back to what we currently have close to 100% confidence will actually be funded at this point. Home program, another federal funding source, which comes from HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Federal Agency, adds another 9.6 million. The city also received more COVID-19 related dollars from the state through its HHAP and SB2 housing programs. The reduction in project home key funds simply reflects the truing up of the city's original request to actual money that was awarded. Next slide, please. This slide is the current uses of emergency relief funds. What you saw in the last slide was the sources. And now this slide dives a bit down into the specifics of how the different pots of federal, state, and local funds are currently allocated to the city's various COVID-19 response efforts. As you all know, the CRF or Coronavirus Relief Fund monies, which is called out separately in the first column on this slide, is required to be spent by December 30th, 2020. We're keeping a very close eye, as Lee has already said, on the spending of those particular funds to assure that the city uses all those monies by the due date. With that, we've gone from now the $310 million that we had before, excuse me, $307 million that we had before, and now we're at $317.7 million in overall emergency relief funds that have currently been appropriated. Um, Jim Shannon, I'm going to turn this over now to Jim Shannon, who is going to provide a high level perspective on what happens after December 30th. Jim, and next slide, please. Thank you so much, Luz. Good afternoon, folks. Jim Shannon, City's Budget Director. So we came back, um, oh, we came to Council back at the end of September with what was then our best estimate on the pace and the type of expenditures in the Coronavirus Relief Fund through the end of December, and that constitutes the, the funding strategy that you saw on the previous slide. Um, so we're roughly about 60 days uh, from that action. Um, and so we continue to analyze you know, how quickly the funding is being spent, within which categories it's being spent. Um, and you know, it, but we still have a little bit of work to go. You know, we do anticipate that not all the categories are gonna be fully spent by the end of December but that those needs are certainly gonna continue on um, as we get into January and throughout the remainder of the fiscal year. So a couple of the example categories um, that will be probably fully spent by the end of December is looking like consultant and planning support, facilities improvements, the FEMA local match that Luz had mentioned, and then some of the local assistance. Um, but we wanna make sure that we don't leave any money on the table and we wanna make sure that we maximize the use of our emergency reserve funding to help our residents the most. Um, and so we are gonna put, so we have a plan that we wanna bring forward back on, on the 8th and it's gonna do a number of adjustments. And so in the coronavirus relief fund, we're gonna make sure that we spend every dollar that we have been allo allocated uh, to best you know, uh, support the response efforts. And so there's gonna be some shifting of funding within the categories you know, first to make sure that we're, we're maximizing the assistance to those that are the most vulnerable, but then also, you know, uh, making sure that we are reimbursed for eligible personal services expenditures for staff that were budgeted somewhere else, but have been redeployed to support the pandemic response efforts. Um, and so, you know, that is going to, um, uh, uh, you know, by doing those efforts, it was likely that the amount that's budgeted currently in the CRF, you know, we started for 2021, um, we had about $10 million estimated for personal services costs in the coronavirus relief fund. Um, you know, that will likely um, go up because we have always known that, you know, the amount of support that we're giving to the response um, isn't always going to be reflected in the budget. The budget amount is going to be much sort of lower in the coronavirus re relief fund. So there's some capacity to raise that dollar amount probably by an additional, somewhere around an additional $10 million-ish is our preliminary estimate, which we will refine in the coming weeks. Um, and so, what we, all, we'll, we always do in San Jose is that we're very deliberate about how we budget and, very, and, and capture our savings very closely. So for those folks that are, have been redeployed from their normal budget allocations in the general fund that have been gonna be re reimbursed by the CRF, you know, we're gonna recognize the savings that's going to result from that action. Um, and that will help us provide some bridge funding to continue those emergency services 
um, past January. Although we're hopeful that at some point we might get another uh, federal stimulus bill, we have to plan as if we're not going, going to. So by being strategic about how we redeploy um, general fund savings in 2021, and also continue to look at that continuity of operations reserve that has helped provide some supplemental funding for some of those emergency response categories that maybe don't exactly fit within any, any of the existing categories through external sources is gonna help us put together a strategy that we can um, you know, at a reduced level, but still be able to fund a level of response um, beyond the end of December. And so we'll be looking forward to coming with you for that discussion um, in a few weeks. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Jim. Next slide. Uh, before I move on, I do want to thank um, all of the employees that we have uh, working in our emergency operations center and all of the partners that we have, our nonprofit partners in this response. It's truly amazing to, to work with each and every one of you and, and greatly appreciate the sacrifice and hard work that you've been able to put in. I also would like to thank each of the artists uh, that were showcased today um, during the presentation. Um, you know, very inspiring artwork that I think has helped us all uh, and a great opportunity for us to continue to weave in more of the community into these presentations in the future. Next slide. As we do with every 3.1, we are highlighting one amazing uh, organization and partner today um, that has been part of our pandemic response, San Jose Conservation Corps has been a partner for a very long time and before this response, uh, but during these past few months, they've pivoted uh, to meet the moment. They have been critical to ensuring that we are feeding and housing our community. And to highlight this work, we're going to play a short video for you today, highlighting their work during the COVID-19 pandemic response. Well, the state of California is preparing for an overwhelming surge of patients. We're going to be doing more with AmeriCorps and Conservation Corp in the state of California. Uh, all of this in the spirit of meeting the moment. when they open these food boxes, they really see our care and our appreciation. Conservation Corps is our boots on the ground, building resiliency in our mountain community.
Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to San Jose Conservation Corps again. Uh, thank you for helping with the video. Um, with that, that concludes the EOC's part of the city manager's report. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dave Sykes to cover the city's roadmap. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, so um, thanks to the team for all that work. And so the last segment here for 3.1 is, is our, our next installment of the, the city roadmap. Um, and we wanna provide a preview as, as we all know, 2020 and our response to COVID um, and really the, the subsequent economic crisis has really strained our capacity as a city. And in, to be honest, 2021 could, could be even harder. Um, you know, last month I said that we're, we're in for a reckoning and I, and I wasn't trying to be dramatic, um, but certainly we must reconcile uh, what is most important with our, our ability and capacity to, to, to deliver. Um, and so I really appreciate this opportunity. And, and in this case, capacity um, means more than just funding. Um, it also means leadership capacity. Um, and by leadership, um, we're not just talking about CMO staff and, and department directors. We're talking about the capacity of those uh, much deeper in the organization that is really, really being stretched. And so the roadmap that we are Previewing, you, previewing with you today is our, our articulation of the projects and strategies and policies that are most important for our city in this era of COVID as we, we seek to control the virus and, and recover as a community. Um, you know, the mayor and the council are responsible for directing how we use our capacity. Uh, we here as staff inform that process by assessing how much capacity it takes to deliver work and, and also recommending what is the best use of that capacity. And hopefully the roadmap is a way for us to have a conversation with you all about what is more, most important right now and ultimately get your direction uh, to guide us now and in, into the future. So we started this conversation with you formally in, in September when Kelly Parmalee initiated a presentation on city services which we followed up, uh, uh, Kelly followed up with a much more detailed presentation last month in October. And this is really the part three of that, that discussion. So next slide, please. So the way we are thinking about this is that our, our focus is really twofold. Um, making sure our essential core city services stay intact and, and continue to be provided and then prioritizing uh, the, the vital few change initiatives, the project strategies and policies and, and being able to prioritize those. Um, these potential priority changing initiatives really come from several different uh, existing prioritization processes shown up here on, in, in purple on the slide. So we have our, our council uh, policy priorities uh, from last February. We have city staff enterprise priorities, which, were, which are really priorities that we've operationalized from council directed work. Um, and then um, we have the priorities derived from our COVID response uh, roadmap that we established back in March that's really uh, held true to the current day. So this really amounts to 103 uh, change initiatives to, to be considered for prioritization. Our, our goal with the roadmap was to elevate all of these to relative to one another and prioritize uh, the vital few initiatives as we feel we can successfully deliver while also continuing uh, to deliver city services. Um, and it's important for us to note that the progress on the previous priorities, certainly the ones back in that we did in, in February, have suffered and, and have been delayed because of redeployment of resources to focus on on COVID related priorities. And this discussion today is really about being transparent about these, these trade-offs that we're having to make. Um, next slide, please. So we, we as a staff have done a significant amount of thinking and debate about the value of each one of these initiatives and what it will take to both change through the change initiatives and, and continue on with existing city services. Uh, last month in under 3.1, you heard from Kelly about our city services and city services consumes most of our staff and day-to-day -day effort in what we normally call 
business as usual. Uh, but these days, it's really nothing is business as usual. And so this includes everything from police and fire response to garbage and recycling pickup. We've obviously had to shift our focus to a, a shorter list of essential services and really completely imagine, reimagine and redesign the ways we provide these services to ensure that they're done safely in a COVID environment. So the roadmap that we're talking about rests above this uh, city service delivery. Um, it is about what we are changing and, and about the work that we do. And, and so it's either things that are completely new uh, to us, such as scaling food, uh, city, uh, countywide initially and citywide food distribution. And then of course it includes things that are not routine, but require considerable citywide effort to drive forward, such as, as the Google development. So these are two parts of the same complex picture um, and what we are doing day to day to deliver services to the community and what we are changing to do better to, to meet the needs of our community and meet their expectations. Uh, to deliver on both these, we really are drawing on the same uh, pool of capacity, the same group of leaders across the organization. So as we work through the roadmap together, uh, we should keep in mind that adding to these initiatives on the roadmap has impacts on, on other work that we are doing. So next slide, please. So this is the current status of all of our 264 city services. Um, we reviewed these with you in a fair amount of detail last month. Uh, more than 6,100 of the city's approximately 6,700 employees are, are committed to delivering these, these services. Uh, most of these services have continued throughout the pandemic or have been restarted or expanded in recent months. And then some of which might be paused or modified again as we transition uh, back into the purple tier. Next slide, please. So the, the four step process we took to prioritize the 103 change initiatives was based on the agile methodology of weighted shortest job first. Uh, to score each of the initiatives across four attributes. Uh, each initiative was then scored on the, the Fibonacci sequence for each of the four attributes, uh, which were then used to calculate a final score. The scoring revealed a stacked ranked relative prioritization of the top must do and high priority initiatives. It, it is important to note that this is really the first time I think in my career that we've attempted to integrate all of our roadmap, uh, all of our priorities onto one work plan or, or roadmap. Um, and I will admit to you for many of us, probably more me than many, uh, it is required that we, we kind of give into this process and, and let it play out. Next slide, please. So, um, the process we took allowed us to be really more holistically, to more holistically understand prioritization. And we really considered four attributes. Community value uh, captures the impact of initiative. Opportunity enablement and risk mitigation captures the potential losses of not doing an initiative. Time criticality captures the urgency of an, an initiative and then job duration captures the complexity and level of unknowns of an initiative. Next slide, please. So this is our draft of a citywide roadmap. We looked at 103 projects, strategies and policies, as I said, and, and evaluated them in terms of uh, the terms that I described on the previous slides. We met uh, numerous times as a leadership team with senior staff to work through and, and debate and decide on the prioritization. Uh, the limiting factor is how much we can take on really for the rest of the fiscal year. That's kind of how we, we guided our thinking. Um, the draft uh, roadmap outlines the 44 most vital projects, strategies, and policies that we believe we are capable of, of delivering uh, through the remainder of the fiscal year. Uh, the 44 change initiatives are in the purple boxes and we have organized them according to the enterprise priorities just to help us um, kind of organize our work. 
this roadmap is our data data driven view of what are the most important initiatives for the city through the end of the year, as I said. And obviously to to get down to 44 from 103, we've had to leave some things off the list. Uh, we haven't decided never to do anything on these items. Uh, we've pasted them in a, in a backlog so that we can get to them as we finish things on the main list. The good news about these 44 items is that they represent a body of work that we believe we can deliver on to our community through the remainder of the year. Next slide, please. So moving forward, uh, we want to give the council and our community the chance to engage with us, uh, to give us input, uh, make changes, and ultimately uh, we will be seeking um, council direction uh, to formalize this at a special session. Um, the, the roadmap will also be helpful to us and guide our, our budget proposals for the next fiscal year. So to move forward, what we're proposing and starting today is, is sharing the roadmap with you all um, and seeking your, your initial feedback on, on the process and content. In January, um, we'd like to conduct town hall meetings with mayor and council members to get community feed, feedback on the roadmap. Uh, staff will be facilitating or helping with those. And then in February, as I mentioned, we'd, we'd like to have a special council meeting uh, to really debate and decide on the final roadmap um, that uh, will be informed by what we've heard in the community and really be our pathway forward. Uh, in parallel, we're also working with staff of all of our departments to operationalize uh, the work here so that we have a cadence and a process to ensure that we're delivering on, on the, uh, the priorities on the roadmap. So in closing, um, really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with the council uh, as I said before, we owe it to you to give you the whole picture so that we are, are really truly working together and there's no uh, kind of black box effect. Um, we certainly need your help to be able to narrow our focus to the most important work ahead of us. Um, and, and I think need to be willing to say no at times or at least not yet um, to, to good ideas so that we can focus on the ones that we prioritize. You know, the roadmap is a tool that we hope will guide us through this process. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, we will fall short um, and we will be frustrating our community um, with our inability to get things done if we're not prioritizing the most important work. And so bottom line, we are hopefully seeking a process that works for, for all of us to ensure that we are focused on that most important work and um, very much look forward to your input. So, um, Mayor, that concludes our 3.1 today. I know we covered a lot of ground. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. And uh, all of the staff, uh, Kip and Lee and others are here to help answer any questions that you have.